Hi everybody, welcome from for, uh, sunny Cumbria uh, to the last day of our Legs Matter Awareness Programme. Um, and this session today is going to be about um, exudate management. Um, I'm aware that possibly there's some clinicians attending today, but also hopefully some, some people who are experiencing some lower limb uh, problems with their, with their such, as, such as a wound or chronic edema uh, and or maybe family members. So um, do do sort of I hope you get a lot from this session. So some of you might be wondering, well, what is Exudate? Um, so it could be that you're experiencing a wound on your leg which um, is wet. Um, and that creates some problems for you. Or you could have some swelling on your legs, which is leaking. Uh, people refer to it as wet legs, even though that's not actually a diagnosis. So this session today um, is going to help us understand what Exudate is, um, why it occurs, um, is it good or bad, or when it is bad, what we need to do about it, and what the management of that should be. And that will include the use of certain dressings that will manage, manage your Exudate. So I'm delighted to be joined by Alison McGrath. She is a, a, um, a partnership manager, clinical partnership manager from Hartman, who are kindly sort of sponsoring this session today. So thank you very much, Hartman. And um, Alison's also a, a, a nurse, a registered nurse who specialises in wound care. So welcome, Alison. How are you today? Right. Thank you. At least it's nice to it is. It's glorious here. It's that real autumn feel to it. It's mm. a bit chilly, so uh, but it's lovely. It's lovely and sunny. So um, as I said, this session is aimed at clinicians, but also with for people who are experiencing maybe problems with a wound on their lower limb or their, or their foot, which is quite wet. And we know there are also people that will have some swelling that will will leak as well, and that can be really problematic for them. And um, but do we need to start off by talking a bit about Exudate and, and what it is? C can I ask you that question? Yes, thank you, Sarah. Um, so yeah, as you just mentioned there, you know, Exudate's that fluid that's coming from the wound. So sometimes people call it wound fluid or wound drainage. And it's really just that fluid that's leaked out of the blood vessels and it closely resembles blood plasma. And it really does develop during the initial inflammatory phase of wound healing as the body's response to the injury or the wound. And it's produced as a result of neutrophils and other little molecules that were rush into that site of injury. So the triggering the blood vessels to become more porous and the leak in that protein rich fluid into the wound bed. So in acute wounds and you know your standard little small wounds, this fluid is beneficial because it's cleaning the wound acting as a transport medium for the cells and growth factors which are responsible for the healing process. But in chronic wounds such as leg ulcers, exudate can sometimes be described as a toxic soup, so it becomes harmful to the wounds rather than beneficial to healing. So chronic wound exudate can reduce the action of the growth factors, so it's stopping you know your cells multiplying and cleaning that wound. So it could be harmful to the wound as they break down the wound bed and the newly formed tissue and it prolongs that inflammatory stage of healing, causing peri wound skin damage. So the thick consistency of the chronic wound exudate results from high protein levels, increased white cells and bacteria. So, so it, it's quite complex, isn't it? When, you know, a lot of people mm. refer to it, there's, there's lots of definitions, isn't there, of, of Exudate, you know, wound fluid, some people call it Exudate, that stuff that comes out of, of a wound. So it sounds like there's some, there's obviously it's, it's required in, in wound healing. Um, so when does it become bad? Yeah, so that's it when we're thinking about your leg ulcers. So when you've got those hard to heal and chronic wounds, and the healing process is disrupted, your exudate levels are increasing or they can change in the composition in the way that's maybe damaging to the wound and surrounding skin. So think about your venous leg ulcers or like your leaky legs like you just talked about earlier. These generally produce copious exudate levels because the wounds often have large surface areas, which can result from edema caused by venous hypertension or venous insufficiency. But then also exudate production can also increase due to a variety of other reasons, such as infection, trauma, other patient like comorbidities, if patients in heart failure or renal failure, 
or medications can affect your exudate levels. And also if there's a foreign body in the wound. So it's really important that we're thinking what's causing this exudate to increase. I think what you're saying there about, you know, it's the importance of maybe early intervention, because it yeah. sounds like the exudate is much worse the older the wound gets. So I yeah. suppose that's why, you know, we're, we're wanting people with a lower limb wound or a swelling in their leg to have that managed sooner rather than later to, to uh, prevent these complications in the long term, I would imagine. Yeah, definitely. That's it. We don't want it to become chronic in a long term wound. We need to make sure we get and manage that wound early to prevent the edema and the swelling. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, I think that these this problem with exudate, it, it does have a significant, sorry, significant impact on people. Um, uh, you know, I think probably both of us as clinicians have seen that, you know, with our experience of working with people with wounds. And, um, you know, I would imagine, you know, apart from the problems to the wound itself, it must have a, a personal um, impact on people. I know that, um, you know, the conversations I've had with patients with uh, uh, very wet wounds is, um, you know, the smell. I think I think odour is is there right at the top of one of the most terrible um, symptoms or things that people have to live with the embarrassment of it. Um, obviously, you know, wet, wet dressings sitting on a on a wound will increase the risk of infection. And you've just um, alluded to that if you get infection, that is a an increased cause of mm. higher levels of, of exudate. Um, I know that when exudate um, is uh, not managed well, it causes this problem with the what we call the peri wound skin. Um, and that can either be maceration. So uh, that is that sort of white, sort of soggy, boggy skin, isn't it? You know, if, mm. if you sit in a bath for too long or you've been doing a lot of washing up, you, we all see that, don't we? We sort of our fingertips go a bit white and boggy, don't they? Well, that's the same thing, isn't it? That's, that's happening to the skin around a wound because that exudate is sitting constantly on, on that skin. But it also causes excoriation, which is that sort of red, inflammatory, painful, raw skin. And it's extremely painful, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and again, a sort of, um, you know, with 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 odour being the one of the most terrible things, the pain uh, that patients experience from that raw skin must must be just so distressing for people. Um, I think, you know, when you've got that problem with the peri wound skin, you know, what's going to happen is that will delay wound healing, won't it? Because there's no chance that the wound is now in this inflammatory state. Uh, and also, if you think about how wounds heal, where you get this sort of migration of epithelial cells, which those new cells that are forming that are migrate from the edges uh, inwards. And of course, if you've got that problem with the peri wound skin, it, it stops that happening, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so you get delayed wound healing. And if you get delayed wound healing, uh, it, it increases the risk of increased levels of extra. So it's a bit of a vicious circle that's going on, isn't it, really? But, <clears throat> but I think, you know, particularly we need to be thinking about somebody's quality of life, uh, living with, you know, soggy dressings, strike through, in, through to their bandages, um, you know, putting ourselves in that person's shoes, as it were, just even for an hour, uh, I think, you know, it would hopefully get people to think this is not acceptable and we need to do, be, do, be doing more here. Um, and certainly, you know, the, the conversations I've had with patients about, about that is one of the worst things. It stops people going out, they become socially isolated, um, low in mood, you know, it's, it's, it's just awful. I mean, I, I remember going to see a gentleman who, when I arrived, he was sitting with both of his legs in washing up bowls um, and exudate was just dripping from his legs and into these bowls. And he was doing that because the, the, the dressings that he had on just weren't containing it. And the nurses were um, going, I think, every second day to see him. But, you know, by the end of the first day after the dressings, the, 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 the dressings were saturated, 
you know, through the bandages and it was all over his clothing and it was all over his bedding, all over his carpet. And and the easiest way to manage it was to sit with his legs in washing up bowls and he had like a plastic sheet on his bed. And I was horrified that this man was in this state and he had actually a diagnosis of heart failure and it had, a decision had been made that it was too dangerous to put compression on this man because he had very swollen legs, hence the exudate levels were higher um, and therefore nothing more could be done. And, you know, when you're weighing up, as we know, there's, there's only actually quite a small percentage of patients with heart failure where compression would be problematic. The majority with good assessment, you know, it, it is, it is uh, possible to do that. Um, and that's what we did with this gentleman. And in fact, you know, within a matter of days, his legs were dry and he was now living, living a, a more normal life. But that image will always stay with me. Um, you know, that this man's quality of life was, was just awful. Um, I'm just going to share my screen, if that's OK. <clears throat> Excuse me. Just to show you really just... Um, what your skin can, what can happen to your skin uh, with unmanaged exudate. So I've just got some images here. So just bear with me. Um, this is the one here. Um, so I'll just go back, go back. Okay, so these are some images here. So, you know, I described that sort of white boggy area. So this um, second one in, which is the heel or the side of a heel, as you can see that that skin is, is, is white and boggy, um, you know, and, and that wound will not heal until, until that extra date and that skin has recovered. Um, the one further along where you've got um, a lot again of, of soggy, boggy white skin, um, you know, so this is just gives you some examples of, of um, what happens. And if you're out there and you have a wound like that, or you're a clinician looking after a patient um, that has sort of high levels of exudate, and this is what you're seeing, your priority will be to try and um, to get that exudate under control and to improve the skincare. Don't just focus on the wound. It's the skin that you need to help recover. So um, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now. Hang on, stop share, come back to the room as it were. Okay, so Alison, you know, it's problematic, isn't it? Yeah. And, and I think as clinicians, we have a responsibility to make things better for our patients mm -hmm. and to, to manage this problem more effectively. So um, what do you think are the main ways that we can manage exudate better? Yeah, I mean, I totally, you know, resonate with a lot of what you were saying there, Sarah. Um, so in my clinical experience, I've often, again, like just like you, visited patients that you get there and they're sat with their legs on towels. They've got the carpets covered in plastic sheeting. I'm a patient, patients waiting for me to come in the clinic with carry bags or nappies or sandy towels wrapped on the legs. So, you know, it'd be really, you know, interesting to listen to everybody else that follow in our session here, other experiences and, you know, really think about what we can do for these patients, because it must be really hard for them having these thick legs or this wet wound. So we really need to think about that holistic patient assessment, assessing why this is happening, what's happening to the legs, why we're getting that excess leakage. So when we talked earlier about what's causing the excess, the exudate levels to increase, is it due to infection? Are we putting compression on correctly? Looking at the underlying factors, just so we manage that patient holistically and really help them with that, you know, prevent them having issues with the quality of life. It's really, you know, we need to step back sometimes and just really think about it from the, the patient's perspective. I think, I think, yeah, it, the, the trouble is, I think sometimes happens, you know, time is always an issue, isn't it? And, mm. you know, to be giving enough time to really get to the crux of what's going on. Um, and I know that, you know, when when I was teaching, when I was working in, in Oxford, um, you know, and I was saying about the importance of assessment to get to the bottom holistic assessment, and you need to give that time. Otherwise, if you don't dedicate that time to really getting to the bottom of what's going on, you know, you're never going to progress 
And I think sometimes people despair because they think, well, I haven't got time, but it's, mm. it, you know, you have to try and find that because these high exudate levels are there for a reason. And it's, it's you know, you can't just put an elastoplast on it and think, well, it's the wound and therefore I'll just put a number of dressings on and it'll be okay if you haven't addressed the root cause of this. Mm. So, um, so I absolutely agree, you know, holistic assessment, I mean, nutrition or poor nutrition, as we know, you know, people with low protein levels, um, that can increase swelling, can't it? And of course, that swelling can, can then increase uh, wound exudate or leakage from a swollen limb. So um, I absolutely agree that we need to get the, the assessment right, and, and get to the to the bottom of what that underlying cause is. So what, what else do you think um, forms part of that sort of, you know, that 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 package of, of exudate management, of what we need to do? Yeah, I mean, again, when you were talking there about your patient with heart failure, and, it, you know, I've, I've experienced that a lot as well, where I think, oh, I can't put compression on. But well, that's why it's you know, important to work across your MDT, like involve your heart failure nurse, your, your clinicians, to make sure you can manage that patient effectively. But also, you know, we're looking at what's causing the exudate. So making sure, you know, if we can put compression bandages on, that's going to, you know, support that venous that, that circulatory system, reduce the, you know, the leakage. But the, again, we need to think about what dressings we're going to use. Make sure the right products, dressings are going to use to manage that exudate. And also think about the patient's skin care to so prevent that, you know, the skin breaking down, become macerated, or if they've got varicose eczema, how to help that, that skin effectively. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we, we are Legs Matter week, so mm -hmm. we're talking today. I mean, you know, if you've got a wound anywhere on the body, there will be a degree of, of exudate, and, and hopefully, you know, the majority of those wounds will produce natural levels of exudate. Uh, but we're today talking about wounds on the lower limb or foot um, or maybe swelling on the limb, which is causing problems with, um, <clears throat> excuse me, exudate. Um, but we know that the majority of leg ulcers or lower limb wounds are associated with venous hypertension or a venous insufficiency. And we've had a lot of sessions this week on what that actually means and 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 what the cornerstone of treatment is, the gold standard, which is strong compression. So, um, you know, I absolutely agree that 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 is the key to getting extra aid under control, isn't it? In these in these circumstances, do you, do you think um, there are any barriers to that at all, Alison? Do you know, do you think there's some nervousness around compression? Do we do we uh, apply it adequately? And is it strong enough for these problems? Yeah, that's sometimes the issue, isn't it? Where sometimes, you know, patients might be nervous of having like a strong compression system applied because of the way they think it's going to cause pain. So it's really important to work, you know, collectively with the patient because there's a quite a wide range of compression systems available now. So, so if you can work in conjunction with your patient, and it depends on the exudate level, whether they've gone compression hosiery, short stretch, long stretch bandages, they all have different effects. So it's making sure we're also using full compression because I've, I've been there when, you know, the distant nurse has gone in to see the patient and the patient will say, oh, not too tight nurse. So they won't do it too tight because they don't want to hurt the patient. And, you know, but that's not really going to be effective for that wound and that, you know, making sure we reduce that exudate. So it's really important that it's done correctly and sufficiently. And, you know, the patient understands the purpose of why we put these bandages on and why we need, you know, what it's going to do to help them. Yeah, I think it's a really good point that actually, because it's around education, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And I, And I think... If people experiencing these wounds just see it as a wound and not actually understand why it's not healing or why it's increased or why it's got high levels of exudate, I suppose it's it's um, there might be less chance of them tolerating um, or be willing to to have that strong compression. But also it goes back to the pain thing, isn't it? We were talking about earlier. So so we know that if you've got a swollen leg, that that sort of high levels of, of oedema is painful mm, yeah mm. you know I've had patients who look at me in horror when I'm saying well the solution to this problem is that we apply this compression bandage and I explain all about it and as if you want to put that on my leg when I'm you know got this this amount of pain and it's about that 
confidence, that trust, isn't it? You know, how you explain it, how you work in partnership to to build that trust to say, you know, uh, I, I can't guarantee that by the end of today, but the chances are that if we can get this compression on you, the pain level will come down, your exudate level will come down and the wound will start to heal. But if they've got that sort of peri wound pain, you know, because of the excoriation, mm -hmm. you know, again, you, it's it's around, you know, care of the skin and and looking at, a, 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 you know, an analgesia um, plan, isn't it, as well, to sort yeah. of manage the pain more effectively until things start to settle, really. Um, but there's a, there's a lot to consider. But but, you know, compression is. Mm. such a fantastic therapy isn't it you know yeah. in yeah. in these sort of cases um and as you said you know we need to get strong compression on if there's if the problem is associated with venous mm -hmm. uh, disease so Alison you mentioned dressings um as part of that plan for managing exudate I mean there are loads of dressings out there aren't there all you know lots and lots I mean you, you you're open a a formula and you think where do I start yeah. so I assume that not all dressings are designed to manage exudate you know if you look at the, the national wound care strategy you know they try to keep things simple which I absolutely agree because it's often not the dressings that heal the wounds it's things like the compression but it does say you know uh, non-adhering dressing with with sufficient absorbency yeah. yeah so where do you start I mean what what when we're talking about dressings what might help in the management of exudate yeah that's a good question because that's it when you say when you look at the wound care handbook there's thousands of dressings available to us but it's really important that following your holistic wound assessment and your patient assessment that we do use the correct dressing so we don't get that maceration excoriation more problems so when you think about the dressings that are going to absorb exudate, you know, we've got alternate dressings or hydrofibers that also can debride the wound. Foam dressings are nice, gentle dressings, but they're only suitable for your low levels to moderate levels of exudate. But then your super absorbent dressings, so one of the quite, you know, quite new to, uh, to the market. Any super absorbent polymer dressings have been found to be ideal for managing wounds with moderate to high levels of exudate. And these provide excellent absorption and retention of the exudate, which is the important factor. We want a dressing that's going to not just let the exudate sit on it, but draw it into the dressing so it doesn't cause that peri wound skin damage. And you also need to think about how comfortable and conformable the dressing is. Some products, sometimes patients will say it just feels like cardboard once it's got, um, ex you know, when it's got the fluid into it. And can you imagine sometimes walking around with a dressing that's full of fluid that feels like a piece of cardboard stuck to your leg? So you need to think about how comfortable it is and how it's going to support the patient's wound tail. Also think about when you're applying that dressing, where you're going to put it. So thinking if it is a leg ulcer, and a venous leg ulcer tends to be, or your malleolus, your, your ankle bone. So you need to make sure it's positioned in a downwards area, so it's strategically placed for that maximum absorption. So the, you know, if the patient's sitting there, the legs dependent, sitting down the legs, it's going to collect that fluid into it. So we're not going to get that leakage through the dressing or dripping down the leg to cause further skin damage. So there's lots of things to think about, you know, what dressing you're going to use for the absorption of the exudate, but also how you're going to use it and support the patient with your dressing choice as well. Yeah, it's a minefield, isn't it? You know, and uh, I think formularies have helped because yeah. uh, you will choose a specific product or several products, you know, under each category um rather than you know you sat there as you said looking through thinking well where do I start so mm -hmm. I think you know formulary decisions are, are often based on yes you you've, you've done some evaluations you've looked at the evidence um but it's really important isn't it around educating about the mode of action yeah um and and you know I think it's really important that because otherwise what what might end up happening is you end up with sandwiching, you know, mm -hmm. layering, mm -hmm. um, and, and that can be sometimes through sheer desperation, can't it? Really, because you know you tr think you've tried everything, and you just think, well, you know, if I put an alginate on with a foam and then a, a, a super absorbent polymer on top of that, mm -hmm. and then hope that will solve, I'll add an extra one just in case. Because what we're trying to do here is be cost effective as well in terms of clinical time. So, you know, we 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 want 
as less disruption for the patient as possible. So we don't want to have to be in every day or get the patient in every day to re replace their dressings. Um, and often, you know, wounds prefer not to be disturbed regularly. You know, you want to create a, the, the right environment for healing. So you don't want to be taking dressings off regularly. And you want to keep that nice warm environment for healing underneath the, the dressing there. Um, but, but it's, you know, sometimes when it's not managing it, you end up layering and it's counterproductive, really, isn't it? Mm. Um, so do we do people understand the mode of action? I think there's more to be done. And I know companies like yourself, you know, I think are a great resource for education and um, for, for, for helping cl mm. clinicians decide, you know, what is right for their patient's wound. Um, I'm just going to share my screen again because I've just got some um, more images here. OK, so. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Can you see that all right? Yeah. Hmm. For some reason it's not going forward. <laughs> I knew this would happen. Hang on. I'm going to stop again and do it again. Oh, technology, eh? Yeah, great. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Don't know what's going on there. Oh, hang on a second. Can you bear with me? Hang on. Oh. Uh, oh God. Right. I share screen again. Can you see? Hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm going to yeah. be with you one second. Nearly there. Aha, there we go. I got there eventually. I don't know why my screen had frozen. Right, okay, so um, here's an image of an alginate. So as you know, alginates, they were in contact with um, wound fluid, will produce sort of a gel. And as you said earlier, Alison, um, that, that is great for debridement. So if you have sort of um, a biofilm there or you have some slough or some necrosis, it's great to help lift that away, isn't it? Yeah. But it also because it will absorb, those fibres will absorb exudate as well. So this is great on a wound that maybe is just sort of moderately exuding if you need debridement, mm. but you will need a secondary dressing with this product. So you need to get that right. So this image, as you can see, they haven't got that right. I can see gauze on there. I mean, that would just be a big no-no. It's not going to do anything, is it? And you can see the the, the lines where the excoriation, if you can look and yeah. yeah, can you see that there? Yeah. So that's where obviously the exudate hasn't been controlled and that alginate is just a bit of a mush, isn't it really? It becomes a bit gloopy and it's now causing some peri wound problems so that is alginate so again if you're going to use an alginate i would suggest you know for high levels of exudate it's it's not going to manage that um lower levels if you're trying to debride will be really good but as i said you need to get your secondary dressing right with adequate absorbency so foams if i'm going to be honest with you folks i'm going to get shot down now but i'm not a big foam lover um, and and that is they've got a place, definitely got a place in wound care. But my concern is that they're often used for the management of high levels of exudate. And sorry again, poor image there. But this was an image um, of someone that I saw many years ago. And as you can see there's been a sort of patchwork of foam dressings put on that limb. Um, and clearly it is it is, hasn't managed it. The, the, the wound is, is deteriorating. The skin is excoriated. The strike through. It's just like having a, a sponge you'd have in the bath. You know, it's, it absorbs the exudate. And certainly if it, it is not suitable for higher levels of exudate, certainly under compression. So all it does is it squeezes that fluid back onto the skin. So just think about how they work. I think. There are a lot of foams out there, and I think the fluid handling ability of foams does vary from product to product. So again, you know, ask to see the evidence. 
test it yourself. But if it's high levels of exudate, I would steer well clear from that. Hydrocolloids, now, people who manufacture hydrocolloids, they do, they does come under the category that it could be a product that manages exudate. Now, um, I would say that when you've got high levels of exudate, no, it will, will not. And this is what's happened with this heel. Uh, hydrocolloid was put on, it, it got wet underneath. It, it's not pulling exudate away and locking it away. It's just now sitting on the skin and it's caused that maceration. So again, higher levels, moderate to high levels of exudate, I would suggest steer away from a hydrocolloid. So Alison mentioned about the super absorber, absorbent polymers. So these are a sort of more advanced high tech sort of technology dressing, if you, if you, if more innovative, if you see what I mean. Um, and there is a range out there that, um, again, you know, you need to talk to the companies about their products, ask how they work, look for the evidence. But these dressings are certainly you know a good resource for you to use a good product for people who've got higher levels of exudate and they work by changing their structure when they're in contact of, of with fluid um, and they sort of draw fluid into the fibers within within the structure of the dressings and you sort of get this wicking away which pulls the fluid away from the wound and protects that peri wound skin You've, you've probably heard of um, things called MMPs, are these sort of proteases that can become very harmful when uh, wounds are more chronic. And dressings like these will help reduce the level of, of MMPs in chronic wounds because of that filtering, that locking away of fluid. Uh, so they're really good at, at sort of moderating those levels. And if we can moderate levels of MMPs in chronic wounds, it will start to bring that wound out of that inflammatory phase and, and move it on to, to healing. Um, you might have heard of the, the sort of vapor transmission rate, the moisture vapor transmission rates. That's what, when we're talking about evaporation. So dressing shouldn't be like totally occlusive because all you're gonna do is keep fluid within the, the dressing and then on the wound. So you do need a degree of, of evaporation as it were. And uh, products like this will have a high level of that. So you've got absorbency and you've got some um, vapor transmission rate as well, which is good. It will then prevent hopefully leakage um, through the dressings and into the bandages. You know, this is not a panacea for, you know, mega, mega high levels of exudate. We know that initially some people, despite using dressings like this, still require daily dressings initially until you get on top of it. You know, the bottom line is even great dressings like this will only absorb so much, you know. Um, and so, you know, don't just think, well, this is the solution to my problem or my patient's problem because, you know, until you're on top of exudate, uh, you still need to manage and use the dressings properly. So because you, you're sort of managing the exudate better, you, you then it's helping you uh, protect that peri wound skin. And the good thing about these dressings is they are really great. They work really well under under compression. Uh, so and these are just some examples. You'll you'll get some that are um, uh, non-adherent or non-boarded, and then you'll get sort of boarded products like this one image here with like a silicone um, layer, a contact layer. So if you have a, a problem with very fragile skin or very painful skin, um, that's really great because you've got it's a double whammy really. So you've got sort of uh, the atraumatic element of that, but you've also got sort of really good absorbency. So that's fabulous. Right, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now. Sorry, this is a bit bitty, everybody, but I will get there in the end. So, um, uh, Alison, I've heard that some people are a bit nervous about using dressings like the super absorbent polymers underneath compression. Uh, they're worried about um, sub bandage pressure because obviously as the dressing swells, they, they're worried that it will increase that sub bandage pressure. And I've heard horrifyingly that people <laughs> sometimes apply them on top of the bandages. Uh, have you found that? I mean, does that really happen? 
it was something that I experienced um, about 10, 15 years ago when people would think about the classes law, about shaping the limb to make sure they're going to have the right shape to the compression to work effectively. But then, as you mentioned there, unfortunately, I'm still hearing that's happening in some parts of the country where, you know, thinking like if they put a bulky dressing around the malleolus, is that going to affect how the bandage is going to work? But from experience, we all know that the dressing isn't going to affect your sub-banded pressure. And if necessary, if you're using a long stretch bandage, you may want to shape the limb still using, you know, your wadding layer. But it's really thinking about the absorbency of the dressing and making sure you're protecting the wound to help it heal and using the correct compression over it. But as you were saying there, if you're going to put your super absorbent dressing outside the bandage, that's not going to manage the exudate. It's not going to protect the skin. So it's not going to be, you know, there's no point using it unless it's going to be in contact with the wound, is it really? No, no, I absolutely agree. And, you know, again, putting yourself in that patient's mm. shoes, you know, if you if you're out and about and you had a dressing on the outside of your bandages and and obviously if it's on the outside, not on the inside, I, I assume that exudate has has come through because there's nothing underneath to stop it, you mm. know, is, is absorbing it. And it's now, you know, there on on showing everybody this, you know, the exudate in the dressing. So so in terms of, you know, what people are experiencing, it must be awful. But yes, it, it, it would not surely be um, uh, the, the, the dressing wouldn't be working properly because no, it has to no, be in no. in contact with with exudate so um i suppose you know it's about how do we um instill more confidence in that mm -hmm. and to reassure mm -hmm. people that it's okay to do that um uh, i know that uh, recently i had this conversation with leanne atkin because uh, like about 10 years ago she wrote um a paper on this their, this very topic and saying that you know they they've done like a mini study and found that yes there was maybe a, a, a risk uh, of, of increase, you know, of, of sub bandage pressure when these dressings start to swell. But um, as a lot of research concludes, there's oh more research is required. Well, I think over the last 10 years, um, you know, we've we've improved products. Uh, we've got a better understanding of products. We've used and tried and tested them. There's been more research. Um, and, and also around our compression. And, and I think we've concluded that actually it is safe to do this. And, it, and even, you know, Leanne admits that, that 10 years on, we've all learned that actually this is okay now. So I, I think it's, again, it goes back to understanding the product that you're using um, and making sure that, you know, your, your, your ducks are in line, as it were, in terms of before you embark on this treatment plan. So I, I think that, first of all, if you're going to be putting compression on anyway, you need to be confident that that it is safe to do so. So it's about having, you know, a robust lower limb and vascular assessment uh, that, um, you know, again, it's a good a good assessment of that lower limb in terms of shape as you you mentioned earlier Alison we know that people will have some distortions in shape so again I'm going to share my screen <laughs> I'm going to share my screen last time hopefully for you um okay oh that worked first time did it <laughs> so here are some some shapes um as you can see you've got the middle one there quite a large knee and a much slimmer um uh, gator area and um, the, the first one there's very distorted isn't it there's oedema there in the foot there's you can see an ankle but really right from the ankle you've got huge amounts of of uh, lymphedema there uh, and then the other one around the um, inner side of the ankle there so these are problem um, ulcers aren't they Alison because mm. you know it's around needed some targeting targeted compression to really address these sort of malleolar or retromalleolar ulcers um, and you know getting your compression right is really important so take the middle one for example I absolutely agree that you need you need to maybe shape a limb sometimes but it's not over shaping is it no, no. Uh, you know what we're trying to avoid is using multiple multiple layers 
of wool, which one will cause some slippage possibly of your compression bandage, uh, but also it will then reduce the effectiveness of the compression being exerted. So the chances are you're trying to aim for a 40 uh, and with all your wool, you're, you're lucky if you, you get 20. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I agree that we need to maybe think about bony prominences um, and any real distortions in shape. And sometimes when you have these really uh, complex limb shapes or complex wounds, this is where the specialists, you know, they come into play, don't they? Um, because we do have lots of tricks up our sleeve in terms of, um, you know, uh, different bandage techniques to address certain sort of hot spots as well, or problem areas such as retromaleola or, or a big, big sort of calves and small ankles, etc. So do seek advice, you know, don't just think that this is left to me as a, as a district nurse or a practice nurse, um, you know, because bandaging can be complex when you have complex shapes um, or complex ulcers. So do seek some advice and, um, and often then you will get some support with that technique and it's something that you can take on yourself. But, you know, when you're thinking about using, say, um, um, a super absorbent polymer dressing to absorb maybe a, an ulcer that was on this leg in the middle, you know, once you've placed that around, I'm a great believer in, you know, use, use the, the dressing size to fit the size of the wound. So, you know, I, I, I just found uh, when I was in practice that, that, you know, you've got a wound that's less than 10 centimeters in circumference sort of thing, but people would wrap a whole dressing around the lower limb. And, you know, one is that's a waste because the chances are that all that dressing won't be saturated. It, you know, doesn't need a dressing that size, but also then you're adding, aren't you, to bulk to size, you know, and then you're adding the wall on the top and then your compression goes on. And this is why it becomes ineffective. So again, you know, you, went, you mentioned earlier, Alison, about, you know, how you position the dressings um, to capture the exudate most effectively. You know, I'm a great believer in sort of putting it as a diagonal. So you over the malleolus, so you can capture that. So again, you know, this is where companies are brilliant, aren't they? That you can show them little hints and tips and things like that about how you position dressings to to manage the exudate more effectively is that you know do, do you do a lot of that do you have people out there to help with that sort of thing yeah definitely because that's it sometimes it's thinking outside the box isn't it what can we do differently I mean on the third picture you had there where you saw the wound over the malleolus you know where would you put your dressing and how would you position it so it's going to be effective so it is really sometimes, like you say, position the right way so it's going to manage that exudate and we're not going to have to change it too frequently. Yeah, definitely. And, and you know, we, we're we talking about clinicians here sort of delivering the care. And, and I think if you've got really high levels of exudate, it clearly um, suggests to me that the wound is, is quite complex. Mm. Uh, and if it's a swollen leg that's leaking, the chances are that there is some real focused compression bandaging going on. But of course, you know, we've we've moved a lot into um, supported self-care haven't we mm -hmm. uh, certainly yeah. over the pandemic um, and I think you know this is why it's really great that hopefully we've got um, non-clinicians here today because I think it's important that patients themselves understand how these dressings work and um, to be able to either manage that themselves or to maybe suggest if they're feeling that that they're wound isn't being managed effectively and you know it's wet on a daily basis it's you know been able to then talk to their clinicians about you know I listened to this great session <laughs> on exudate and uh what do you think of such and such you know so so I think you know there is a lot of of or an increase in in self-care or supportive self-care going on so so I think it's really good that you know companies can also have education stuff for for patients as yeah, well yeah, yeah. So um, finally, really, Alison, um, what advice would you give to someone who's struggling with an unmanaged exudate and they feel so really we just touched upon that a bit. But you've got mm -hmm. somebody who is at the end of their tether. They feel they're not getting anywhere, um, that the leg is wet on a daily basis. Um, you, they might not be in compression, but, you know, what advice would you give them? What's the next steps, really? 
Yeah, so like you were just saying there, from a patient's perspective, you know, patients, you know, the public now we've got Google, we know what to, you know, what's how to look for things, get the information. But the main thing from a patient's perspective, you know, if, if it's some you know, patients on this call today have got these leaking wounds from the leg, what can they do from the like from themselves or ask the family to support them? Sometimes and the amount of times, sometimes you know, people can manage, can't get out the chair, they can't go to bed and start with their legs down for long periods. So have they got a chair that reclines? Have they got a footstool so they can put the legs up to reduce that edema building up? And also sometimes it might be something simple, just like bringing the bed downstairs so they can go to bed in an afternoon and have a bed rest and help that those legs elevating. Also looking at compression, you know, are they not in compression because they can't tolerate it? Is it uncomfortable? Have we looked at different types of compression to see what's going to be managing that? And that's what something I've done a lot in practice where the patient may say, oh, I can't wear those bandages. But they've had a bad experience with a certain bandage system, put them in a different one, the wounds healed you know, quickly because we've gone to a different system that works well for them. And also from a clinician's perspective, again, are we using compression correctly? Like we were just saying earlier, is it applied properly? Is it the right level of compression? But then again, like we were saying, you know, asking advice, speaking to a specialist, getting some support of, well, why has it gotten such high levels of exit? What's going on? Are we understanding what, you know, what's stopping this wound from, from healing and progressing? So there's lots of things to think about, really, isn't there? There is. And, and I think, you know, what we're trying to get across from the Legs Matter campaign is about recognising what is, is not normal mm. um, and to, you know, to seek help sooner rather than later um you know recognizing that if you if you've lived with swelling in your leg or you've got some staining the chances are that you know you've got some venous problems so if you did sort of end up with a you know a, a trauma to your leg because you've bashed it on the garden gate or something it's it's recognizing that the sooner they seek advice and get the right treatment it will then hopefully stop you know, the wound becoming chronic and then having increased problems with things like wound exudate. Mm -hmm. But I absolutely agree. I think it's um, it's it's a partnership, isn't it? So the clinicians there with her expertise, the knowledge around, um, you know, the, the products that can be used um, and the treatment plan that they hopefully will will um, form in, in partnership with with the patient. But also, yeah, I think that's a really good list of um of things that patients can do themselves and, and I think leg elevation if they've got swelling is particularly mm -hmm. important mobility getting that calf pump you know yeah. working and getting that squeeze isn't it get the blood back up the body uh, and nutrition as well isn't it yeah. you know certainly if people when you've had a or got a wound and you've got pain people don't eat well uh, and it's incredible particularly in older age people can become quite anemic and not realize it's like you know it's a silent anemia that's happened gradually over years and protein levels can drop as well can't they which then increases mm -hmm. the problem so um yeah uh, i think that's a really good sort of holistic package of 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 advice so thanks for that so um that that's the the session now and and um i think we're, we're going to look at some if any we've got any questions uh, if you haven't posted any questions already um please do so i'm just going to go in and have a, a quick look okay so there's people that are sort of agreeing um you know, around, excuse me, foam dressings, maybe not, not managing exudate effectively, and they end up becoming quite heavy and, and pulling on the wound. And that would also go for the more advanced dressings, such as the saps as well. You know, as I said earlier, they will only contain um, so much exudate and, and, you know, you know, the difference is you can get like a, a very thin dressing that, people will think gosh well that's not going to absorb much but of course it becomes more of a cushion doesn't it when it mm. swells with exudate and then you can get sort of a, a more sort of fabric uh, fibery sort of dressing with the same top technology within it which goes on at a thicker layer initially and then absorbs but again when that's saturated you know it needs to be changed and this is why you need to be monitoring the effectiveness of the dressings that you've chosen. So I'm a great believer in starting a patient off. You're giving them advice what to look for, you know, if 
if you experience these things, this is what you need to do. Um, but then either following them up with a, a call the next day um, to say, how is it? If you've got any strike through, is it comfortable? Particularly if you're starting compression, um, I think a follow up call to check everything is great. Um, but then sort of, you know, when you do go to see the patient again, it's a bit like peeling an onion, isn't it? You're sort of there with the with the compression. Nope, no strike through. That's great. So you're taking it down and the layers. Nope, nope. Great. Your bandage is dry. Is the wool dry? Yeah, that's great. And now you're down to your dressing. So how much exudate is in that dressing? Is it heavy? And you've just caught it, you know, is it too heavy? It's too wet. There's a bit of sogginess around the skin. It could be that maybe you needed to visit more frequently. Um, but if it's fine, the peri wound skin is, is lovely. And I'm a great believer in, you know, um, using an emollient to make sure that you've got sort of a good, a good, it's not a barrier as such, but you're rehydrating that skin, aren't you? You're improving the health of the skin. Sometimes skin barriers, products can be used when you've got excessive problems with peri wound damage and I would say that it's great as an initial treatment plan um, but then you know pull away from that once things are under control because it doesn't need to be used as an ongoing thing um, but but again you know you just need to test how wet is that dressing so you can then judge how frequent you you go in um, so I don't think there's any more questions there don't think so but anyway Alison thank you so much and thank you to Hartman for um running this session with me and um just to say that we have uh the next session coming up which is living with cellulitis at two o'clock so please join us for that and then I'm back uh with another um industry-led session at 3.30 so please join me and really importantly well they're all important is that I'm also doing a session with one of our patient partners uh, this afternoon at uh, five o'clock which I think will be brilliant because it's about you know her experiences of living with leg ulceration um, and why she became a legs matter uh, partner with us so thank you for your time and um, enjoy the rest of your day and Thanks a lot, Alison. Thank you, Sarah. Bye then. Bye. Bye.